I was a gang member. I was a killer. I was a sociopath. I was sexually molested pretty much my whole life. Got a taste of this, this violence. It's, it's scary, but it felt good. Talk about this shameful little secret. It was so traumatic. Satan stole my virginity. I was standing at the gates of hell. It's been an incredible journey. It's so emotional because it's just a transformed my life. Your suffering's come to an end. It was like a dark tunnel, but all of a sudden, at the end of that tunnel, I could see a little light. It just came pouring out of me. And then everything changed. My whole life is different. Forgiveness, hope, and ultimate redemption. God, the one you've been searching for, was real. Are miracles real? Well, I can only testify of what I've personally seen and what I've witnessed, and I have to say unequivocally, yes. Miracles are real because Jesus is alive. He's been raised from the dead. The most shocking miracles I think I've seen have been among those that have been uh, deranged or demonically oppressed, people that have been brought in chains, uh, tied up, that have been completely set free just by the sharing of God's message. To see them in their right mind, to see them restored to their family and to dignity, uh, that's been, and to society, that's been some of the most shocking miracles that I've seen. Now, Anthony, you're a pastor. Yes. You study the scriptures. Today, the word miracle or miracles is used by many to describe numbers of things. But I'd like to know what the word actually means from a biblical perspective. So help me understand what a true miracle is as defined by the Bible. All right, well, I'm glad you made the differentiation because sometimes, you know, people think, well, I finally, it was a miracle. I got a parking spot at the mall. You know, that's not really a miracle. You know, that, that's just a you know, coincidence or whatever. But a miracle in the Bible is the temporary suspension of natural law by the divine uh, presence of Jesus. You know, it's, a, it's an act, an event where God undertakes that cannot be explained by natural law. Now, um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, I believe, Paul the Apostle, um, who wrote, I guess, almost more than half of the New Testament, he mentions in 1 Corinthians 12 that the Spirit gives to a person um, the ability to work miracles. So as a pastor, as a teacher, um, what does that mean to work miracles? The nature of God is He's love and He's supernatural. And so I believe that when we see the gifts of the Spirit in operation, for example, the gifts of healing, it's revealing the nature of God, that He loves to see broken things come together. And uh, when it's miracles, I believe God wants to, he, oh, it's always for the betterment of somebody, uh, you know, or it's a display just to glorify God. For example, one of the workings of miracle would be Jesus walking on water. Well, that wasn't really to help anybody, but it just showed that in Christ, he's got authority over natural law. And uh, so for that, that helps to encourage our faith, to know that it's not about the bigness of our faith, but about the incredible bigness of Jesus. Now, I, I've heard it said many times by Christians, and by Christians, I mean those who've made a commitment to follow Jesus Christ. I've heard it said that the greatest miracle that one could experience is being born again. And, and that's what I'm interested in, your personal encounter, your personal transformation, that experience when Jesus changed Anthony's life. So, so tell us, um, how did that happen? What happened? Yeah, that was uh, back in September of 1982. I was in Cranbrook, British Columbia in my friend's trailer. And we were counting, you know, our, our money to see how much beer we could buy that night. His roommate came in and just began to share Jesus with me. And, and you know, it is the greatest miracle. It's an eternal miracle. It's one that's going to last for all eternity. And for me, that night, when I heard the simple gospel of Jesus Christ clearly and lovingly presented, I, I knew it's what I wanted. 
And so I invited Christ to come into my life. And, you know, I was raised Roman Catholic, so I was a good Catholic. Well, no, no, I was not a good Catholic, okay, but I, I was Catholic. I, but I did my prayers every night. But something different happened. I experienced Jesus. I, I, it was a moment where I, as I invited Christ, because I believed in Jesus all my life, but the Bible says, for as many as received him, to those he gives the power to become a child of God. So although I had believed in Jesus all my life, I would never received him. So when I received him, I received the power. And the scriptures tell us, God takes the same power that he, he used when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand. And that's the spirit, that's the power by which he makes us alive, or we become born again, or new creations. And uh, the Bible says that when we were dead in our trespasses and sin, Christ makes us alive. And that's what I experienced, a living Jesus. I didn't join a religion, I didn't just pray a prayer, I didn't turn over a new leaf. I experienced Jesus in that moment and I l knew how loved I was and how forgiven and accepted before God, not based on my uh, efforts or behavior or any qualifications of myself, but because of what Christ had done for me and for every person. It was like the light came on and I literally felt something just lift off my life. And and I remember chuckling on the inside, like this is, re this is real. And I had this understanding, it was a voice, it wasn't an audible voice, but I knew it was Jesus. And he goes, yeah, I'm real. And you're gonna tell your generation that I'm real. So I knew from that moment that something had changed. So, and, and Jesus gave you a message that you were gonna change or speak to your generation? Yeah, and, and, and tell him that he, that, and, and tell my generation that, he, that he's real. I'm a witness, right? I, I've, uh, and, and we're all witnesses, those of us that, that have followed Jesus. And a witness is someone who's got firsthand evidence. And so for me, you know, it, that's my story. Now, a few years later, I believe it was 1985, you um, decided to join a ministry trip to a foreign country. Why did you do that? Man, I just got, I got turned on for Jesus and I felt like, um, you know, if I had the cure for cancer, would I keep that quiet? If I had the cure for COVID or AIDS, would I, would I hide it or hoard it? I just thought, no, I, I want to share this. And uh, an opportunity came just to go to India, and so in 1985, and so my best friend and I, Rod Harris, we went and we lived in an orphanage, and I just thought, well, where's the need greatest, you know? In Canada, a lot of people have access to the gospel or the church or, you know, television, media, it's all there. But in India, in some parts of India, there's only one Christian worker for every three million people. And I thought, well, I want to, uh, you know, if, if I see 10 people carrying a pole, nine people got one end and only one on the other, well, I want to go help the guy who's got the heavy load on his side. So that's, that's why we went. So we just decided to go and work with a local pastor over there. And um, when you were there, what happened? Did you see anything unusual? Well, the pastor that invited us was arranging for a, 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 a Jesus festival in New Delhi with Canadian evangelist Peter Youngren. And uh, I saw the poster, and so we were just there to help. I'd never met him before, I'd heard the name, but his posters were everywhere, and they were quite, you know, in your face. Come see the miracles of Jesus, the blind see, the lame walk, the deaf hear, thousands hear the good news, Jesus heals regardless of caste, creed, or religion. So I was like, oh, I, I, I'd never really seen uh, a, a verifiable miracle. And I prayed for people that had like headaches or had a pain in the elbow, but I'd never seen blind eyes or deaf ears. So we, we met this, you know, this, this evangelist and I said, hey, we're here to help. Uh, what can we do? And he looked at me and said, well, you got a good camera there. You can take pictures of the miracles as they happen. And he looked at my buddy Rod and said, and uh, you record them, you write them down. And we said, yeah. We can do that, and we went back to our hotel room and burst out laughing. You know, like, what are you doing tonight? Well, I, I'm recording the miracles as they happen. How about you? I said, well, I'll be photographing them as they happen. And we, I mean, we, we wanted to believe, but it just, I'd never seen it, you know, I, but I, I wanted to see it. When you started taking pictures and recording, what did you see? I was shocked, man. Like, the gospel is the power of God into salvation. We don't pray it down, we don't work it up. It's not an emotional frenzy. It's the simple message of Jesus. And this evangelist, Peter, preached the simplest gospel message. And uh, 
hundreds ran for it to receive Jesus. That was what shocked me. And, and, and I watched that. And then he started to pray for the sick in categories. And I just thought, you, that's not the way you do it. You don't do it. You don't do it in categories. I mean, first he started praying for those that were that were that, that were deaf. He says, first, you know, gonna, you know, all of you that are deaf, you brought someone that's deaf, bring them to the front. And he just commanded with authority, in the authority of the name of Jesus, for deaf ears to open up. And then blind, then he went for the blind, then he went for the cripples. And I saw amazing miracles. But can I be honest with you? Hmm. I couldn't believe what I saw. I didn't believe it. It was it didn't impact me one bit. It was like water off a duck's back. I thought, I don't know, maybe I was thinking it was going to be really sensational. Like there would be a choir of angels singing Handel's Messiah in the background and a cloud would roll in. I, would, I don't know. But I, 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 if you're looking for something sensational, sometimes you'll miss the supernatural because it's quite simple. So I had a, I had a crisis that night. I, I couldn't believe what I saw. So how did you deal with that? I went home and uh, I got on my face before God and I said, okay, Jesus, you were in fine form. Peter did all right. Issues with me. What's wrong with me that I cannot accept what I just saw with my own eyes? And I realized that, you know, in, in our Western culture, we have elevated the place of reason and logic above the place. You know, our worldview is not a supernatural. We have elevated reason and logic above that place of simple childlike faith. The natural mind receives not the things of God, but yet Christ lives in my heart. Tells me that my spiritual capacity is far above my mental capacity. And so I realized in, in my mindset, in our Western worldview is, well, if I can, if I can, if it's logical, if it's reasonable, if I can measure it, I'll accept it as truth. But faith, it gets a hold of the invisible world. It sees Jesus. And so I realized that so much of my Christianity was all up here. It was logic, it had to be reasonable, it had to make sense. And if it didn't, I couldn't accept it. And so it was not so much as an intellectual thing, but it was a heart attitude. And uh, so I, I did some repenting and asked Jesus to help me to have childlike faith that night. <laughs> these, these are funny. Some of the old advertising. So this is in Duran Bazaar, which is the far eastern part, portion of Nepal. Uh, the gospel got there about 1976. We had about 600 known believers in that region before this campaign. And uh, so we went out there. And so basically what I do is I share the simple gospel. I just share Christ, His finished work, what happened at the cross. And at the end, we do mass prayer. I basically grab the microphone and just command blind spirits to come out, deaf spirits. Uh, I do what Paul did in Acts 14, where when Paul perceived that the man, the crippled man had faith to be healed, he said in a loud voice, stand up on your feet, and the man got healed. So he didn't lay hands on him, he just spoke, he just commanded. The prayer and the time that going up to the, to the point where I, I, I take the podium, I'm realizing that it, it, Anthony Greco of himself has absolutely nothing that can qualify, nothing that can make an eternal difference. It's about that life of Jesus on the inside. It's about the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, I of my own self can do nothing. It's the Father who dwells in me who does the work. And you kind of you kind of go through like an emptying out. You realize that you're completely dependent upon the life of Christ on the inside of you. That He's the vine, you're the branch. You know, the branch doesn't produce the fruit. It just bears it. But it's the same life that is in Jesus is the life that's in me. And that's where our strength is, recognizing that it's a heavenly gift in an earthen vessel. I've traveled to over 40 nations. I've spoken to people from pretty well every background, from atheist to whatever religion. And there is that desire. God has placed eternity in the hearts of men. And we need to get back to inviting people to enjoy that living relationship with, uh, with the divine in his name is Jesus. Every day, siku, follow Jesus. Fate I will live for him. Now we should we live him. in his love. He should go the love that he has for you. Jesus has started a miracle in your life today. It's a lot of fun when people realize and they see that Jesus is real, that God's forgiveness is available, that God loves them, that the powers of darkness are broken, and there's a God in heaven who loves and cares for them. Uh, it's just a great, uh, it's a, it's a great atmosphere to be in. Now come on, see you all that 
believe. Now, tell me about the people that that have been healed. Like, what wh what has been their response? You know, uh, when you see a family restored, when you when a father comes one night and gives his life to Jesus. You know, we had this fa father in, in Shinyanga. I believe it was Shinyang, was in Tanzania, he was drunk and gave his life to Christ and went home and brought his deaf boy and he gets healed. I mean, it's just the laughter, the joy, the tears, you know, it's, it, it moves you. But all that is to, these are signs and wonders and they always point, you know, a sign gives direction. We always bring it back to Jesus. The same Jesus that healed your body is the one that brings peace into your life and that offers eternal life. You mentioned the signs. Um, what about community leaders? What about government leaders? How have they responded? How have they reacted? Yeah, you know, when we go into a, uh, uh, in Tanzania, for example, we love going into the Muslim areas. We don't like going where everybody else has been. We like going to remote areas. And uh, when uh, what we do the first night is we do a, a dinner. We invite all the Muslim leaders, all the political leaders, and we have a, a friendship dinner. And I share with them. And I just talk respectfully what we have in common and uh, I promised them I'm not going to speak against your prophet your religion your your holy book I said I'm here to point to the person who's mentioned 98 times in your holy book in the Quran Isa al Masih Jesus is mentioned and so I said I'm here to lift up Jesus and I preach the gospel I don't compromise my message but I let them know that our prayers will be without discrimination if Jesus wants to heal a blind Muslim woman no discrimination. By the end of it, they're hugging me and, you know, and they're inviting me to speak in the mosque. Now, I haven't spoken in a mosque yet, I just because it hasn't worked for our schedule. And then when they come, uh, you know, we've had Muslim, Muslim clerics in Tanzania come out, hand out handbills, inviting people to come to the Jesus meeting. Then we finish by doing another victory dinner at the end with the same political leaders and the Muslim leaders, and we talk. And I, you know, the political leaders love it because we're respectful, we're not attacking other religions, we're just lifting up Jesus. And the Muslim leaders are now have seen a bunch of Muslim people in their community experience miracles of Jesus. So one sheikh in Tanzania said to me, his name was Sheikh Balilusa. He said, Dr. Greco, he said, thank you for introducing Jesus to us. Because in the Quran it says in the, the, that the, without the Injils, which is the, their word for the gospel, a true Muslim's faith cannot be complete. We need Jesus. Do you believe that, that God has, or the Spirit, has given you the spiritual ability to work miracles? It's amazing because it's the power of the Holy Spirit. When you realize, I don't have anything about me that could do any of this. If it's not Christ in me. If it's not the presence of the Holy Spirit, I'm hooped, you know, and, but God is faithful. And uh, he, he that, you know, Paul said, you know, not that we are anything to think that our sufficiency of ourselves, but, you know, but he has qualified us and he, it, our sufficiency is of God. And so that is where our strength is in, trusting in the Christ that's in us. I believe it's for everybody, a supernatural lifestyle. Listen, supernatural God, has supernatural children. And the fact is this, miracles don't, is that divine stamp, as I said, it's not on the, on the minister. Come on, donkeys prophesied in the Old Testament. Jesus confirms his word. It's his gospel. The gospel is the power of God. That's what I'm looking for. So sometimes, well, how could that person have miracles in their ministry when they live such a double life? Because God was not, a, you know, it's, it's not a, a sign and a wonder to approve the, the minister, but the message. So it's available for everybody. So bringing this home to Canada, what you've seen overseas compared to Canada, you know, there, there obviously is many weak and sick amongst us. Mm -hmm. How come we don't see the same kind of miracles, type of miracles that um, you have seen that are recorded in the Gospels, that Jesus mm -hmm. performed, uh, the Acts of the Apostles? Mm -hmm. I, I, you, you mentioned it a little mm -hmm. earlier, and I don't want to be um, insensitive, but, you know, um, I, I guess it's easy to pray for someone that's got a sore elbow, mm -hmm. you know, because it gets better and they're mm -hmm. healed, but you, you don't really know mm -hmm. that. But, you know, blinded eyes open, deaf ears yeah. unstopped, or people that are crippled or lame that can't walk, mm -hmm. all of a sudden can walk. How come we don't see that here in yeah. Canada? That's a great question. And, 
you know, we definitely, you know, do see it, but not to the same, you know, level that we see overseas. And part of it goes back to the worldview, right? I think a lot of times when we go overseas, there's a supernatural worldview. They believe in the power of blessings, curses, angels, demons, the spirit realm. Uh, so in North America, you know, you're dealing with, you know, you have more of a, you know, even Jesus, when he went to his own hometown, it said he could not do many mighty miracles there because of their unbelief. And so he went in a circuit teaching. So I think we have to teach. I think the other thing that is a, a real issue here um, in North America, you know, I asked a good friend of mine, uh, Wayne Myers, he's 96 years old. I asked him a, the same question and his answer, he said, well, he said, Saul never slew a giant and there never was any giant slayers in his ministry, of, you know, so to speak. David killed Goliath and David had four mighty men that killed off Goliath's brothers. And he said, Anthony, he says, if we as leaders aren't living in faith, dependent upon Jesus, we have nothing of, uh, e nothing of eternal substance or spiritual substance that we can deposit, you know, in the life of our believer, in, in those of our, of our followers or our flock. We must live in faith because the origin of the word determines the destination. We have to be living in faith. We have to be communicating that message. And I think uh, that expectation, I think, is important. Uh, uh, miracles don't happen because people have needs, but because we expect them to happen. And I think we need to lift up our eyes and get a fresh vision of who Jesus is, because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He wants to do these miracles here in North America. And I just think that we as churches need to get bold, to be convinced that it's part of the scriptures, it's part of the present day ministry of Jesus and step out and expect to see them happen. Anthony, one final question. Um, if someone's watching and listening to you right now, they need a miracle, but yet haven't received a miracle. What would you tell them to do right now? I would tell them to open up the Gospels, take their nearest Bible they can find, and just start reading about Jesus, you know, and get to know Him because He's the author and the finisher of our faith. And you know, too often I think ministers have put so much pressure on the person, you didn't have enough faith, or maybe there's something wrong with your faith. And I, that, that is so painful. Here's someone who's suffering, they're in pain, they need help, and then you're putting that on them. No, it's the fullness of the life of Christ on the inside of us. So I tell people, get to know Jesus. So just meditate on Him and His life because He's the author of your faith and the finisher. Anthony, thank you so much for sharing your story with us today. Thank you. If you want to learn more about the gospel of Jesus Christ and how it can transform your life, you can request a free Bible by calling toll-free 1-888-482-4253 or visit www.gideons.ca forward slash request. You can begin your journey with Christ now. Thank you.